Heavenly Father, we thank you again, um, Lord, for all that you've given, um, Lord, for us to enjoy uh, this grace that is is free for us, uh, Lord. But of course, uh, as we remember today, um, what it cost, Lord, uh, what it cost uh, you, what it cost the Son. What it's cost um, all those that have um, all the apostles, Lord, all the uh, Old Testament saints, uh, Lord, the prophets, um, Lord, it, it cost them their lives as well uh, to bring your word to us. And uh, Lord, may we not um, um, just uh, forget that, Lord, may we, may we be students not only students of your word, Lord, but um, ones that desire uh, from a uh, motivation of your love and grace, uh, Lord, as we uh, get to uh, hear from our Creator and uh, we get instruction, Lord, on where we need correction in our thinking, uh, what we need to think, Lord, where we get correction in our behavior and how we should be behaving uh, as ambassadors of Christ, Lord. And uh, may we not fail to see the distinction uh, in, in your word, uh, Lord, uh, as we uh, start to go through um, these passages in Romans that have to deal with our spiritual maturity. Uh, Lord, uh, may we, uh, may clarity be brought to um, our understanding uh, and as we look at uh, varying views today uh, on this uh, topic, Lord, um, I pray that we would use this again in, in a directive of prayer uh, so that we might be um, uh, more precise uh, in our prayer um, and uh, know how to pray, Lord. Uh, and so um, we just give you this time and uh, pray that you would um, uh, prepare our hearts, uh, that your spirit would illuminate your word and give us understanding today. In Jesus' name, amen. I think I said, this clicker and I are going to have a, a talk later. Hold on one second. I think I set it down there. I sh it should be, it should be, you know, it should be like tied to my hand or something. Okay. All right. So yeah, let's. Uh, if if you can stand, we'll, we're going to read through six. Um, and again, part of part of what we do when we observe the text and when we uh, look at God's word, one of the things that we do is that we read through it. We read through it. We read through it again, and we continue. You know, we always say about eight times you start to get kind of a good idea, you know, of what's, of what's going on. Um, but of course, that's before we go to any interpretation and before uh, we even start observation, observation of the text. So uh, we're going to read through six again, and then um, uh, uh, we'll get into our study. Again, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also 
Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which uh, you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You may be seated. Okay, so... Having come out of Romans 5, you know, we ask ourselves, or many of us have, might have asked ourselves after we became a Christian, I'm, I'm, I'm saved, I'm justified, now what, right? How is it that I, if someone has said this to you or you know the scripture, how, how is it that I become conformed to the image of Christ? You know, how is... Ma- is spiritual maturity achieved in the life of the believer? And some of the questions we might ask is, is there a single event that needs to occur after, after justification? Or is it a process? You know, what's, and then what's the potential of my spiritual progress? Can I reach uh, complete spiritual maturation? Uh, or... Uh, only partly and so again what how and you know how far am I to be conformed and so and let me first say so sanctification you know why all the fuss right let me actually let me get through our let me get through our review before we get through here because I do want to take a look at this Um, I just want to make sure that we understand the Old Testament because uh, this is going to play a part also into our understanding of sanctification. And we made a few observations last week, I think, that are key. Uh, in the Old Testament, of course, the Kadash, the holy, set apart saint. When we look at this term, and you can see all these carry with it a different meaning. So when you look at the text and we observe the text and we come across any of these terms, holy, saint, sanctified, consecrate, clean, it could mean one of these things. So these are, this is a, 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 a realm of possibility of what this term means. Now, there's a lot more work to be done to get to what the author, how he's actually employing the word that we're not going to get into, but I gave you a little bit a few weeks ago in the Greek um, as to how we can start to understand how these words are being used. Um, we are having actually a conversation yesterday about, you know, verbs and nouns. And, you know, just to be clear, you know, uh, obviously a noun is a what? Person, place, or thing. A verb is action. 
So the verb describes the action of the noun, of the person, place, or thing. So when we go through and we're reading the text, you know, these are, these are, these English, uh, you know, laws of grammar also do apply to, um, to Greek, but there, you know, again, there are some uh, uh, nuances uh, with the spelling of the word is what changes parameters on certain, on certain um, uh, uh, words and, and so forth, but, but remember that this term is determined, you know, of course, primarily by context. And so we need to put scripture, this is why we always need to keep scripture in context, because when we pluck it out, we, we, we lose all of its surroundings and we have no way of knowing how this term is being used. So in the, uh, again, number 1638, how it was used was of the censors of these men who sinned. Again, remember this is, this is Korah and the whole group. They, they sinned against their own souls, the word says. And it says, let them be made, uh, these censors, into hammered plates. So once the censors were presented before the Lord, because they presented them before the Lord, therefore they are holy. And they shall be a sign to the children of of Israel. So these censors, when these uh, ones that were sinning against their soul, even though they were sinning against their soul, they presented these instruments before the Lord, and the moment that they were set apart for, holy, uh, for a holy purpose, they were in fact holy. And then their, their purpose, again, uh, was exalted to a place to cover the very altar. And so and the purpose then was to be assigned to the children of Israel. And this was to remind them, you know, of this, of this instance. So again, you know, New Testament word group for uh, sanctification. And, and you can see the similarity is consecrate, set apart, holy, holiness, saint, or hallowed. So I'm going to skip forward a little bit. So we looked at a working definition of sanctification. Uh, it means to set apart to the service of God and set apart from that which is not associated um, uh, uh, with God. Set, set apart from that which is not associated from God. So sanctification, we said, uh, based off of John seventeen nineteen and Hebrews 5, 8, we see that the Lord Jesus sanctified himself. So resulting from that, sanctification is not inherently related to sin. Again, it's not inherently related to. So when we look at the term sanctification, it not, might not be saying it's being set apart from sin, uh, but rather uh, set apart for a specific use. So we need to keep these things in mind when we're understanding the term. Um, these are all definitions that we need to consider. Now, when we talk about sanctification in the life of the believer as spiritual maturity, primarily, primarily, we are talking about, again, got, you've got to come back to the context, it's for the, the, uh, the theological uh, definition then, is that it, it deals with the relationship of the believer to sin, uh, whether it's from the past penalty, uh, the present power, or the future glorification when we are um, in glory uh, once we see the Lord. So that's how we should understand um, sanctification. And again, primarily in this context, what we're dealing with is freedom from the power of sin. And of course, this is, um, w as we'll see today, um, um, all these things are, are working together and most people have this I would say there are about five views that have this as we'll see and they are primarily on board with the majority of of, uh, of this uh, but there are some differences so we'll take a look at those but uh, just as there's three stages or tenses of, of justification sanctification uh, we look at in, in the same way uh, so sanctification being saved from the penalty of sin as God declared us holy um, at the moment of believing um, the gospel of Christ. And then what we do after that, again, in our spiritual maturity, it's a progressive, practical, um, uh, being delivered from daily sin. Uh, and then um, 
Of course, that's, we could say experientially over the power of sin. And how we say uh, uh, that's achieved according to the Bible is that if we walk in or walk by means of the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Importance in order, as we'll see. So, and of course, we're all looking forward and hope uh, to uh, the future where this will become an eternal reality and through our glorification we'll be saved from the very presence of sin. Um, so again, we put up some scripture just to look at how these are used differently um, in our text, in our uh, context here, Romans 6, 19. Uh, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. Uh, NASB says resulting in sanctification or unto holiness, uh, the Darby, and then leading to sanctification. Uh, so you can see there's a little bit of, of, of variation there uh, in, in, in its meaning. Uh, so we'll, we'll get to that later though. So purpose of sanctification, of course, it's the will of God uh, for your life. And then the primary purpose of sanctification is doxological, meaning that it is to glorify uh, the works of God uh, and what he has done now in a fallen world, an abnormal world uh, removed from creation uh, to glorify himself and to glorify uh, the saint uh, back to um, a holy relationship with him. So God desires then continued fellowship and Christ desires for the church to be one with him. Christ also desires for us to be co-workers in or with him. And so sanctification benefits the child of God. It delivers us from the power of the sin nature as it, as it the sin nature, provokes the spirit of Christ within us. And sanctification makes us presentable uh, uh, for the service of God. The benefits are both temporal and eternal uh, as we will be eternally rewarded um, through the things that are done uh, according to the spirit of God. And so, again, this is the big question. How does it happen? And so, it is by grace through faith as the, the, the word instructs us. Because he tells us in Colossians, Paul writes to Colossians and says, As you, therefore, speaking to the believers, have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. So the same manner that we re received Christ Jesus, we are to instructed to walk in him. And that is by grace through faith. Uh, Ephesians, uh, Paul writes to Ephesus and says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. So that's, that sums up uh, in short how our walk is. It is by grace through faith. So, and as we've seen in our most recent context, the just shall live by faith. So, which brings us to the question, who's doing the sanctifying work? Of course, it is God. It is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And this one is really important because we miss this, and we'll come across this in Romans 8. By the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body. Not by your own power, not by trying to beat sin into submission. Walk by the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Do you see the order? It's not try and beat the lust of the flesh and then walk in the Spirit. It's what, it's walk in your position and your identity and you shall not fulfill the desires of the flesh. So we'll get into this more. So again, why all the fuss? Well, I wish it were as easy as to just you know, come up here and say, okay, here's sanctification, here's what it means, have a good day. Uh, that'd, make, that'd make my study a lot easier too. But uh, that's, that's not the case, because our sanctification has to do with how we live the Christian life, how we are prepared for service, and whether or not we are successful uh, in our Christian service. So, and it's not that easy, because as we'll see, there is much confusion around the process of spiritual growth. You know, at present, at present, there are approximately eight views on the doctrine of sanctification. 
But of these eight views, if you took your hand out today, you'll see we're going to consider about five. Because there are, there are five. It's not that the others aren't worth considering. They're just, they are kind of um, pretty far removed from um, the text. Uh, you know, e- e- even the gospel of those systems is completely inaccurate. So, but just so we know, these five views, they are the Reformed model, the Wesleyan holiness model, the Keswick or victorious life model, the Pentecostal model, and then the Augustinian dispensational or Chaferian model. So those are the names. But before we get into and ponder these various views of sanctification, let's look at the primary reason and see some examples of why a clear understanding of sanctification is essential. And I've already mentioned, you know, this, is, this has to do with our effectiveness in our spiritual growth. But Paul R. Uh, uh, Schmidt-Bleicher accurately states that a faulty view of sanctification hinders spirituality and stunts spiritual growth, even driving believers away. Everybody agree with that? Or anybody disagree with that? I can tell you from my own personal experience that this is a valid assessment. Because as a young man, I was told that if I did not act a certain way, if I did not, um, you know, speak in tongues, if I didn't do these things, then... I don't know, I would question whether or not you have the Holy Spirit in you. As, as a young man in youth group by my youth pastor. And again, I don't, I don't have hard feelings against my youth pastor. I think he was, again, this is what he was taught, okay? So, and, you know, looking at the lack of the Word of God in the church, now, you know, uh, years later and looking back, you know, it's no wonder that they came to that uh, assessment because there was no, there was no teaching of the word. There was no context for what he had to say. And I questioned it, sure. I didn't just take it blindly, but I did, you know, again, I was like, well, I guess I don't. I guess I don't. So I might as well just, you know, because I've asked for this thing and I've, you know, and of course they hold to as we we'll see a Pentecostal model where there's a a supposed second baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we'll look at that in detail as to how they get there later, but today is not that point. But but it it can cause a person uh, to just throw in the towel, so to speak. Uh, But also then what happens is your, your spiritual growth is stunted. And, uh, and of course our relationship with the Lord is, um, does not grow, but we become uh, stagnant. And uh, the potential to go into uh, carnal living is, um, is amplified. So, and many, there are many on the other hand that have sat under good pastor teachers and they were taught a sound biblical doctrine of sanctification. Now, if you're one of those, you know, praise the Lord. And I praise the Lord for the other because Having experienced that, I now see how the Lord hopefully can use me uh, and, my, and that understanding uh, to be able to encourage people that have had that same um, unfortunate uh, thing said to them. So, so I, I praise the Lord as well, uh, and uh, I see how the Lord has sovereignly brought me through these things. So, if, but if you've set under the strong, sound biblical doctrine uh, of sanctification, we'll praise the Lord. Um, and again, let me say, it's not that these men of God didn't desire to mature in their spirituality and not that they didn't desire me to grow in my spirituality. Again, they were either wrongfully taught by someone they trusted or they came to an erroneous conclusion in their own study of God's word. 
And uh, with that being said, as we look at these views, I want to preface this that with all, all these views, all five of these views of sanctification, uh, what they have in common. We're going to look at that first. And all promote, uh, as pretty much what we said last week, what we just reviewed, I don't think any of them will have too much to contend with what we said um, that you know, that there is a three-stage or phase of sanctification, that there's a past, a present, and a future. You know, basically you are saved and you are uh, saved from sin's penalty, and then uh, there is a spiritual growth process that happens until the point that we are glorified in the future. Uh, again, when we behold our Savior and we are like Him, and then we are glorified and sin is done away with, then... Um, or at the point of physical death, you know, they wouldn't, these views all agree. They also agree uh, that there is some sort of struggle in Christian maturity. Yes, there are growing pains in the Christian life. And as many of us can contest, there are many. And all agree as likewise that because of sin, there are daily choices to be made but with those choices come the hope in the promise of God's word through uh, the Holy Spirit. So all of them agree on these basic tenets, but there are some uh, very um, erroneous teachings. Uh, there are some things that, again, we could look at as we'll go through this and say, oh, well, that's just semantics, but that is the point. That is the point because it, it decides on where my, my faith is, it decides the means, and it decides then also the results. So, what, what, uh, what are some other examples then of, uh, of things that might be misleading? So, example, the first example here is that a, a subjective, a subjective mysticism. So does anybody, everybody knows what that means? Everybody knows that subjective is not objective, meaning that it is determined on the circumstances at hand and every ingredient has to be just right and then there is a manifestation of things. So these are non-transferable experience and what happens is they become the criteria of, uh, of, the, of spiritual maturity. So this is the mentality. And if a subjective mysticism where experience cannot be transferred, because I can't have the same experience that you can unless I'm just imitating it or trying to recreate it between believers, if that's the criteria, if experience is the criteria, then those not experiencing, experiencing such uh, the same thing may see themselves as failures, and again, as in my case, ultimately retreat from their faith. I just, again, in, in, in my shyness as a young man, uh, believe it or not, I, I, I was already palm sweating and everything, you know, because the, the, the preacher asked me to come forward and receive, you know, the anointing of the Holy Spirit and so forth, and, you know, had people urging me to do this, you know, and, and uh, I'm, you know, sweating and uh, getting ready to throw up, and, uh, <laughs> and, and so they're like, no, no, you know, you really need this, you really need this, and, and uh, I'm like, well, Lord, if there's something more, yeah, I want it, you know, and it plays on that desire, and I did, you know, I wanted more of the Lord, of course. You know, if God had something for me, I wanted it. You know, that's what I, and so, you know, I go, I go forward, and, and there's a, a row of, you know, men and women down front, and the pastor's praying for them, and, you know, he's coming by, and he's putting his hand on their head, and people are falling out, and I'm like, man, this is, this is weird. <laughs> the whole time, that's, that's all I was thinking is, this is weird, and so he comes by, you know, puts his hand on my head, and starts pushing, and I'm like, are you pushing on my head? 
You know, that's, that's what I was thinking the whole time. Like, why are you pushing? So then it became a little awkward, and so I just, I was like, you know what? I'm up in front of everybody. My mind's going. I'm like, I'm just going to fall back. So I fall back. Now I'm laying on the floor, and I'm like, when do I get up? <laughs> At what point do I get up? <laughs> you know, and, and this is all I'm thinking during this whole time. And um, <clears throat> so finally, you know, I'm trying to watch around me, and, and some people start moving and start getting up, and so I get up, and, you know, I go back to the seat. And, of course, then, you know, all these people are coming, and they're like, oh, it's so great, you know, and they're, and so now I'm like, man, that was, that was not sincere, you know, and uh, I, I was in torment. You know, I was a young man, and, and uh, I, I even went home and, and came back that following week to youth group, and I went up to my youth pastor. I was like, can I talk to you for a second, you know? And I went to him, and I was like, man, I, I have to, I, I can't, this is eating my conscience, and I have to tell you, like, I don't, I didn't, I didn't expect, experience anything I said I just pretty much you know just because of the awkwardness felt you know went along with what everybody else was doing and 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 you know and I was conflicted because I'm trying to find this actually I was actually trying to find justification in the word and um and I couldn't and and uh, that's when he told me he said well you know if you really didn't experience that I'd question whether or not you even have the Holy Spirit in you You know, as a <laughs> may we be careful, <laughs> Lord, with how we teach our young men and women. That's enough about that. But the the point is, <laughs> if we base our our life on experience, our Christian life and our Christian maturity on experience, Lord, help us because. You and I are not going to experience the same things. It needs to be based on the objective truth of the Word of God and what it says. We need to know what the Bible says about it. So this is how impactful it can be. Another way is, is the supposed removal of the sin nature altogether, that you no longer have the sin nature, making Christian living possible. Is there anybody that got saved and has never had the desire to sin again. But this is taught, okay? This is taught. In this, in this then the system, it substitutes morality and good works for our ongoing relationship. So what happens then is everything is based off of how you behave or what you're doing or all those things and, and, and we use that as whether or not our relationship with God is good, if we're doing good or bad, if we're doing bad. Now, again, keep in mind, these all, you know, these, these things, all these ingredients that we looked at last week are there, but these are just other, other pieces and other uh, parts of what they believe. So, in this system, the sin nature is denied and victory proclaimed, supposedly proven by practicing morality and good works. Uh, and again, in other words, my positional relationship with the Lord is based on how good I behave. Good behavior, good relationship. Bad behavior, bad relationship, right? And, and this is, a, again, this is, this is based off of uh, our morality and uh, the idea that you, sh you, the sin nature is no longer in you. We'll look at all how we get to these uh, as we go through our study. But an experiential empowerment also, um, again, um, you know, um, are fulfilling morality and good works as the basis of relationship with the Lord. Okay, we got that. So, uh, an experiential uh, empowerment where God touches the believer by receiving the Holy Spirit in a second work. And uh, this, this, as we'll see, this, this is all kind of put, put together. There's a couple different views that, that promote this. Uh, but basically, some sort of experience uh, alone, the believer can be completely perfected and made sinless in this life. Now that's, that's one extreme view. 
Um, and uh, as we'll see, there's varying views to this, uh, but, uh, but that there's some sort of second work. And based off of that, again, experience, uh, that is what empowers and causes is the means of um, spiritual growth. And then, well, so why all the fuss again how about a biblical reason to contend for a doctrinally sound view of spiritual growth? Because Paul commands young Timothy here in chapter 6, verses 20 through 21. He says, O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust. Guard what was committed to your trust. Guard the doctrine that was given to your trust be a steward. Guard what was given to you. Avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, that false knowledge, some have strayed concerning the faith. See, if we don't contend for our doctrine that's the outcome. That's the biblical reason right there. So even, again, I had that experience as a young man to where I just threw in the towel. But here's, here's again, in the Bible, some have strayed concerning the faith because the doctrine was not guarded. And it was already happening then. Already happening by the end of Paul's life. So, it is happening today. All right, so let's jump into our models. So the first model, and I'm going to give these, um, it's already 11. So um, uh, I think we should uh, maybe get one in and come back just so that you have something to chew on. So the first model of sanctification uh, that we need to consider is uh, the reformed view or model. So in this view, sanctification is tethered or, or, or tied to the doctrine of election as ordained by God's sovereignty. So, so God's sovereignty then, you know, directs everything and um, a person is either elected or they're not. And if you, are, if you are one of the elect, that is, if God has granted you the faith to believe in him, then depravity and the desire to commit acts of sin are removed over time and gradually replaced by holiness. So then, in the Reformed view, the means are God's sovereignty and election. However, uh, we won't get into this too much, but, but just to, to make the, the point here is that both election and time are unknown variants. They're uncertain. Because, and here's how it's gauged. If sanctification does not happen, in other words, if you don't start acting like a Christian, then you are not one of God's elect. If sanctification does happen and you persevere to the end of your life, then you are counted as one of the elect. So growth results are determined by how much depravity you give to God. You know, so basically the more depravity you surrender to God, the more holiness he gives to you. So we relinquish depravity. God grants you holiness. And uh, we'll, again, well, I'm not, I'm just presenting these in their bare form. Uh, and, and it is a bare form. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, that's about as far as we should probably get because we do have communion. So, um, but Hold on to your sheets. These will be helpful. Again, these will help you uh, to take these home and see and test against God's word uh, what, if there is fault 
and if there is not fault, this is so that we start to think about these uh, modes or models or views of sanctification as we compare the Scripture with Scripture and we start to see these. And of course, these, there are, I will say this as well, there are, even within these views, just as many as there are views, there are varying people vary in their degree on, on what they emphasize. So keep that in mind as we go through these, okay? And uh, let's pray and uh, we'll, we'll, um, we'll get into communion. Father, uh, even now, Lord, we, we do pray, Lord, for all your saints, for all of us, God. Um, we're, all, we're all in need of our, our minds, attitudes, uh, Lord, um, thinking to be conformed. Lord, we have the mind of Christ, your word tells us. And we need to make ourselves subject to that, Lord. Um, as many of us have, have friends and loved ones that we, um, we know, uh, and we're not the end all of end all. Again, we, we, we all need to be reformed in our, in our thinking, uh, and it needs to be done by your word. And uh, so, Lord, as we, as we seek uh, as, a, as a body here to grow in, in your grace and knowledge, Lord, as we seek communion with you, God, uh, may we be um, challenged by these things, Lord. May these sharpen our thinking, Lord. Um, may, as we consider these views, God, may we um, be able to contend for our own doctrine. May we be, as your word tells us, be able to give an account for the hope that lies within us. Why do we hope? Or why is it that we trust you in our sanctification? Why is it that we trust you um, to begin the work or to finish the work that you began in us? Why is it that we trust your faithfulness, Lord? All these things that are, that are uh, questions, Lord, we will be asked uh, when we begin to um, share the good news with others, Lord. And um, Lord, we want to be equipped. Uh, we want to, uh, to be able to use your word uh, to uh, point people into uh, uh, your direction, Lord. And so help us uh, in these things. And as we commune with you today, Lord, uh, may we again um, just take a few, we'll take a few moments just to based off of first john 1 9 take time to um can lord just to, to agree with you if your spirit is showing any of us here today lord uh, areas of our life that we um that need to be conformed into the image of your son uh, lord may we uh, just uh, um, agree with you today on that matter uh, as we uh, get ready to celebrate communion so take a few seconds if there's anything you need to just simply acknowledge to the Lord um, that we can um, uh, enjoy this communion together. And Father, we do thank you for that provision that you've made for us, uh, Lord, that um, um, when we confess our sin to you, Lord, when the Spirit shows us through the word how we violated you and we agree that it's, an, it's a violation and we don't try and run and hide and cover it or anything, Lord, but we agree with you. Lord, you, you forgive us um, not only of that single sin, but your word says you cleanse us from all the unrighteousness, Lord, uh, that we might not even be aware of um, or have just uh, negated um, and so thank you for that, and uh, Lord, may we, uh, as we enter into fe uh, communion here, Lord, again, uh, may we enter into, in a celebratory manner, uh, Lord, as we get to do these things uh, based off of the work that you've preordained and uh, the work that your, your son uh, submitted to uh, through even obedience unto death, the death of the cross. 
And so uh, be glorified as we, uh, as we celebrate you in Jesus' name. Amen.